Third Sunday night. Good morning, everyone. Um, once again, good to have you here. Um, we are clipping along here with uh, season of Lent, um, and uh, so uh, what I want to do is start with the gospel reading found in John chapter two. So I think that's on the third page, um, where John wrote, "The Passover of the Jews was at hand." And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. I just want to stop there. Because sometimes we skip over important things. And, and the, I think one of the big things that's here is, is the, the Passover. Now, does anybody remember what the, what the Passover was all about? Where they put the blood on the door. Yeah, and, and that really was the celebration of the Exodus. How God brought them out of their bondage in Egypt. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, eventually brought them to the promised land, but the Passover was the significant event in the Old Testament. I mean, this was the thing that God always, you know, uh, would point to, that the the Passover, the the release from your your bondage in Egypt and uh, and everything that went along with that. I mean, that was, they were to do a yearly celebration or a remembrance, reminding them of the, the Passover and uh, in that first Passover, they would put the blood over, and the, hence the name, the angel of death would pass over. But then they were supposed to eat uh, a special meal on that, you know, the roasted lamb with the bitter herbs and the salt water to remind them of their bondage, but also the celebration that God brought them out of their bondage. And so uh, every year... Um, Jesus, we're told that Jesus would go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And, and we, we know that when he was 12, <clears throat> he went with his family. He stayed behind. They left. Oh, what's going on? And I'm in my father's, don't you know I'm in my father's house um, uh, and, and doing my father's business. So <clears throat> we have that. So I'm going to stop here for now because I want to go to the Old Testament reading that... Um, is uh, in Exodus 20. So it's on the front page. Exodus 20. So God, beginning of Exodus, the calling of Moses. Um, then Moses goes back to the promised land. Um, uh, and the, uh, you know, then he leads the people out. And now we're at Mount Sinai. So we are, uh, and this is what uh It says, and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I'm going to stop there for now. Now, in Old Testament times, and even today, um, this is called the covenant. It's a contract um, that God is establishing with his people. These people who had been in bondage uh, in Egypt for, well, 400 years, And now God was going to bring them out, and he was going to establish a new community, uh, his people. This is going to be a new way of life for them. Um, And we we know with the Passover, the events leading up to it, you had the ten plagues. And eventually, the last one was the, the, the plague of death. But then we also, remember before this, they get to the Red Sea and the parting of the waters and they walk through on dry ground and God destroys the Egyptian army, pretty much the whole Egyptian way of life. Um, and, and I like to say, literally, God turned the world upside down. Uh, the Egyptians were no longer the world power. Now it was going to be the Israelites. Now it was going to be God's people. Uh, even so much that 40 years after that, that when they're getting ready to go into the promised land, They go to Jericho, and they go, and um, uh, Rahab is the one that hides the the spies, and she even says, um, oh, we know you people because your God overthrew the Egyptians. That was 40 years after the fact. So even that had a lasting impression on all the people in that region of the world. So the world turned so much upside down that even Rahab, 40 years after those events, is still talking about that. Um, and so a huge, huge event. So God, you know, in Exodus, he establishes this covenant. And part of the covenant is, this is what I've done for you. So I, the Lord your God, 
I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. So I did this for you. Now, this is what you are to do in return. So this is the agreement. I will do this, and then you will do this. Now, the rest of it is probably very familiar because we call them the Ten Commandments, beginning of the law. And so um, God does it. You shall have no other gods before me. Um, Now, we um, combine verses 3 and 4, 5 and 6 and 7, all together is the first commandment. Other churches, they'll divide, you shall have no other gods, no graven images. But we just combine just kind of how we do that. Uh, Shall you not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is the earth beneath or that is the water under the earth? You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I... The Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to a thousand of those who love me and keep my commandments. Now, you have to remember that the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, which um, the Egyptians worshipped many gods. They had many idols. They had many things that they would turn to. In fact, it is said that all those plagues were really God's way of destroying their gods. The big god was the god of the Nile, turning the water into blood. And then everything that went after that. And then so the final one was the thought that that Pharaoh was God and and his descendants were gods because God kills Pharaoh's firstborn. And so this is kind of what's going on. So... He's saying, okay, we're going here. You've lived in this world in Egypt where you've seen all these gods, all these idols. I don't want any of that. I just want you to trust in me. So that's what he says, no other gods, and then kind of defining that. Then verse 7, we go to the second commandment, as we call it. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes the name, his name in vain. That's well. Good morning. That's all right. Good to have you here. And then we have the third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner within your gates. For six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. And we read that. Oh, no, we don't, really don't hold to that anymore. Now, what's very interesting that 40 years later, when Moses gives the law a second time in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he mentions this, but he also says, and on that Sabbath day, you are to remember what God has done for you. With him, like that last week, that last month, last year, all the way back from creation. So, um, so today we don't, we, I mean, the Sabbath day, it technically starts at sundown on Friday and goes to sundown on Saturday. So you didn't work on Saturday. Now, Jesus came to fulfill all the law. I mean, this is, you know, he came to do that. And he is now our Sabbath rest. Now he does that. Now, physically, they have determined it is good that we rest. It's good. We should get sleep, and we should rest from our labors. Physically, mentally, emotionally, that's a good thing. So when God establishes this, there's more than, oh, it's a big religious thing. There's there's a lot more that goes along with that. Um, And so, uh, but we live in a world where stores are open, except for Chick-fil-A. You can't get chicken sandwiches on Sunday. And Hobby Lobby is the other one. I mean, those those who hold to those... Convictions. I remember growing up in stores not being open and restaurants not being open. I mean, that was. Yeah, the rules in Missouri yeah. changed for years. Well, oh. that until a couple years ago, we couldn't buy alcohol in Indiana here on Sunday, so. Can now. Can now. <laughs> um, which some days I'm thankful because usually I'm going, we don't have any. Huh, okay. Um, so, so we have that. So we have. So, and then the, the rest of them. Uh, honor your father and mother, that your days may be long on the land that the Lord is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. 
You should not bear false witness against your neighbor. Uh, you should not covet your neighbor's house. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant, his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. So, um, so that, that's what's going on with that. Do you have, you don't have any more after that, do you? Do you, you don't have words? Okay, that, that was, that, that's not part of that. That was a mistake. That's from the Psalm of the Day. I forgot to delete that part. So it's a wonderful thing. In fact, that's the prayer I say before I go into the pulpit, before I preach, just to let you know, from Psalm 19, verse 14. But uh, that is not, when I printed those up, I did that. So <clears throat> we have the Ten Commandments. So we have what's going on there. So, and God wrote these originally for his people, the Israelites, and he was establishing a new community. Now, it doesn't end here, The what he wanted them to do. I mean, there are chapters and books. I mean, this is Exodus. Viticus, Numbers, and um, have a whole bunch of other rules and regulations and laws that they, he wanted them to follow. Worship practices. I call them political laws, meaning uh, what happens if you accidentally hurt somebody or... Uh, in, in, in order to convict somebody of a crime, you have to have at least two witnesses or, I mean, all that, that stuff. Uh, but here is the Ten Commandments. Now, we take those, these Ten Commandments, obviously catechism, and we apply them to ourselves as well. Uh, we say that there are three uses of the law. First is, um, uh, we call it a boundary, guardrails, curves, kind of it's for all people for all time, kind of this, you know, Every society has these, some of their laws are based somewhat on these. You know, it's against a lot of murder, steal, cheat, lie, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then we say for us are the two other uses of law in the catechism. The second one is the mirror, where we sit there and go, how are we doing uh, according to what God wants us to be doing? And if we're honest with ourselves, we find that we fail miserably which then shows us that we need a Savior. So part of the law, function of the law, is to show that we need a Savior. The law was never given in order to save us because we can't keep the law perfectly because of sin. You know, in one of our confessions, we say that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Now, we might be able to do the deed part and the talk part, but usually the thought part is... We get in trouble because, um, so that's what's, what's going on. And then the third use of the law, now that we have confessed our sins in need of a savior, and then we say, okay, God, what do you want me to be doing? And then we go back and we can, you know, honor those in authority, love my spouse, you know, don't hurt people, steal, and so on and so forth. And so we have this. But really what God was telling the people when he's, giving Moses is writing it down or God's writing it down in the stones is that you have been set apart you are special people in fact you are my own possession he tells this them many times you are my people I did this for you as we went back I brought you out of the land of Egypt I brought you out of your slavery I did this for you and now I want you to be my people and how you do that is how you treat one another in fact God was very clear and that he says, you are going to be different than everybody else in the world in how you treat one another. So that when they would walk by, people would go, why are you different? Why do you treat each other nice or you're caring or you're not there trying to cheat everybody? They can go, because we are God's people. We are set apart. We are, as Peter says, we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, people belonging into God. Um, and so that's what's that's going on here. So these laws were said that, you know, God wants us to do these things. Yes, be perfect. Yes, your father is imperfect. <clears throat> is perfect. So it, we need to be doing these things. But the problem is we can't by ourselves because we'll fail. But then we ask for forgiveness, and God forgives us, and he says, okay, now get back at it. Keep going. Keep going. See, I think I just turned stupid. Where is the tenth? The Tenth Commandment would have been <clears throat> what we do in verse 17. You should not covet your neighbor's house is the Ninth Commandment. You should not covet your neighbor's wife is the Tenth Commandment. So the, the first part is the Ninth Commandment and the Tenth I always I think of it this way. The Ninth Commandment deals with stuff. The Tenth Commandment deals with people, living things. <clears throat> 
So that's how we... Now, what happens in other churches, they'll divide out that first commandment, you shall know other gods, you shall not uh, have any image, idols, and then they'll combine, um, you shall not covet both neighbor's house and people. So they'll do that together. It doesn't really matter because in the Old Testament, they're just called the sentences. I mean, they, God didn't number them as we number them. We just, we're, we're people, we like to number things. We do that. Now that, you know, Luther, when he wrote the catechism, that was what the Roman Catholic Church did. That was their very, that's how they divided it up. The, the changing of the numbering system comes during the Reformation. Um, and it really had to do with the first commandment, you shall know the gods. And um, what, was, what was happening is that the churches had all like stained glass windows and statues and portraits and all that kind of stuff. And part, the, part of the, ref, the radical wing of the Reformation um, is that they went through and they said, oh, we can't have any of that stuff. And they started to destroy all these beautiful pieces of art and they said, see, we're not supposed to have any graven images. And in the church said, we're not worshiping them. They're, they're there for instruction. They're there to teach us. They're to remind us. So there was this divide in the Reformation in the dividing up of the commandments. I, you know, people, they get all bet out. I'm going, it doesn't really matter because God didn't originally number them anyways. It's just kind of that thought process. So that's what's going on with that. All right. And then let's go back to the gospel reading. So we have, in John 2, we have it's the Passover. We just talked about what that all means. We have the giving of the law. So God says, this is what I want you to be doing and not doing. Um, and part of that was religious practices, worship practices. The sacrificial system was huge, where God says in the Old Testament, that you need to sacrifice a lamb or you have a grain offering or a, um, a, a, you know, ox offering, all these different things. And they all, they all kind of did different things. There were sin offerings and thanksgiving offerings and, and grain offerings and all that kind of going on with that. And God was very specific about when you did certain sacrifices, what thing you were to be using. Um, and, and the big one was the burnt offering, sin offering. Um, and you were to use a lamb or a goat, and it was to be without blemish. So it was, it was supposed to be the best of the best that you have. It wasn't, oh, let's go find the one that's broken legs and everything and kind of give that to God. It was the, this was the best of the best. Well, people would come from, uh, for Passover all over the world. About 30,000 people normally lived in Jerusalem, but during the time of the Passover, the population swelled to about 10 times that. So a quarter of a million to 300,000 people would come. Well, if you're traveling from wherever, long way away, uh, and you were going to come do the sacrifice, you wouldn't necessarily bring the sacrifice with you because you never knew if it would be safe along the way. So God allowed that you could come to Jerusalem and then you could pay money to get a sacrifice. Now, what was happening was um, that the people in the temple, I couldn't show up with my American dollars. I had to, to trade it for temple dollars. And that's where the markup was. That's where they were cheating everybody. They, they were charging way more you know, what would normally would cost me, what, a hundred, if I'll just use it, a hundred dollars to buy a sheep anywhere else. I get to the temple and it's $300, $500. And so they were, they were cheating the people. I mean, the, this practice of selling, that was not the issue. The issue was the cheating part. So that's, so that's how we're getting to what's happening in Jerusalem during the Passover. So the Passover was there and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now remember, what up meant he physically walked up because Jerusalem was on the highest mountain in the region. In fact, the temple was on the highest part of the highest mountain in the region. So he's walking up. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. 
and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. He poured uh, out the corns of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His December's disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So, um, a little, we, the, yesterday we had a discussion, Pastor Stecker and I had a discussion about this reading. Because in the other three Gospels, the cleansing the temple seems to come at the end of Jesus' ministry. It seems like Palm Sunday kind of in there, he's cleaning out the temple. Here, I mean, this is chapter 2 of John's Gospel. Now, John doesn't always follow chronological order in his Gospel. Very interesting. You'll be reading something, and he'll make mention, oh, this is the woman who poured the oil on Jesus' head. Now, if you're just reading the story for the very first time, you'll be going, what are you talking about? Because it comes two chapters later. (laughs) So John wasn't concerned about that. So the big question is, were there two temple cleansings or just one? And that's the answer I came up with. Maybe, maybe not. But whatever it was, if there was one or if there was two, my faith isn't really contingent upon which one it is. But what it was was that Jesus says, he goes, You have turned my father's house into a house of trade. Now, the way that the temple is built. Oh, look at this. I even have a picture of the temple up here. (laughs) Here's the temple. Big, beautiful structure. This part, by the temple itself, this is where the priests could go. They could go in this part of the temple. One day a year, the high priest or a priest chosen could go into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, and perform uh, uh, set up prayers and, and, and things like that. If you remember, that's the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Remember Zechariah and Angel Gabriel? So that's what's going on. So this is where the priests go. In this part um, is where the uh, Jewish men could go. The Jewish men could go in this part of the temple. And there's, there's doors and gates and this. And then this part, any of the Jews could go men and women, and then this part over here was the court of the Gentiles, so that anybody could go in there. But they had certain places that they could go, and there are the sacrifices going on. And so it is said that during Passover, now, well, you know, well, here, here, I'll just say that it's over here. Over here is the Garden of Gethsemane. It's outside the city walls. Here's Jerusalem. Outside, this is where Jesus is going to go pray uh, on Monday, Thursday, after the upper room thing. Uh, and it said that there was so much blood that was that was um, coming out of the, the sacrifices that there was a what they call a book of, book of Kidron, was a valley, that there was so much blood going through that, that um, young men, boys, 14, 15 years, that they would walk and blood would be up to their knees. I mean, that tells you how much sacrificing was going on here, going on. And so th- this, all during Passover, people, you would, they would do that. Uh, but what would happen is that in this part of the, um, the thing that, that people would come and sell the sacrifice. They could sell the, and in and of itself, there was nothing wrong with that. In fact, there was even outside the, the temple walls that there were people doing it because that was just, people didn't want to drag so they could purchase them. There was, and God allowed for that. The problem was that the markup of the prices, they had to exchange their money for temple money. And that's where they were stealing. That's where they were stealing. That's where Jesus really, really got angry. It wasn't the selling per se. It was what's going on. Now, if you remember some 18, whatever, how many years earlier, when Jesus was 12... He's in the temple, and his parents come, and he says, didn't you know I was going to be in my father's house doing my father's business? It's very interesting that Jesus calls the temple his father's house. That's where dad is. I mean, that that was the belief, that this is where God was. 
In fact, he was in the Holy of Holies. And there was a curtain that separated the Holy of Holies from the sanctuary part. And it was six feet wide. And if you remember, after Jesus died, it was torn from top to bottom. It was like 40 feet tall. So it went all the way. And it, so that symbolizing God was now going to be everywhere. Not that he wasn't everywhere before, but that was just kind of... And that there would be access uh, between man and God and God and man. Sin will no longer be that the barrier between us, between us and God. Just keep that in mind. All right. So Jesus does this, causes all this commotion. Money's flowing everywhere. Of course, the money's just not laying on the ground. If you see money, what are you going to do? And you're going to tell people you're just going to... So, the Jews say to him, now, John likes to use the phrase Jews. These are the people who were of, you know, Jewish descent, but they didn't really believe Jesus, that he was the Messiah. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? They want a sign. We're going to hear in the epistle reading that the Jews always want a sign. Give us a miracle. Give us something you're going to do. And Jesus says to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews said to him, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. And that was true. Up to that point, it's taken 46 years to build the temple. It would not be completed until 68 AD. So another 30 years-ish after this discussion until the temple is finally finished. And in 70 AD, the Romans come in and destroy it. So it only stands completed for about two years, but 46 years. So this is a huge building project, huge. And so they say it took 46 years to build the temple, but you will raise it in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. I always think of it this way. Jesus said, just show you this temple. In three days, I'll raise it again. I mean, that's, I just picture him saying that, doing that. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, this will come up when Jesus is on trial, and they're trying to come up with charges against Jesus. This is the one they come up with. Oh, we remember him, him saying, destroy the temple, and he's going to raise it again. Because anybody who had done anything against the temple... That was seen as doing against God, which was blasphemy, which was worthy of death. So that's, and even, we read that, like, even on that, they couldn't agree on the charge. So this whole God gives them the law to follow the law, they throw all that out. When we get to Jesus, his, his trial, crucifixion, and, and uh, all that goes along with that. So we, we, we have this going on. So Jesus is going, you've turned this. You, you turn this into a simple place. Where's the holiness? Where's the, what, what's going on with this? So that's what's going on with that. But the important, the thing here is, you're going to destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up again. So he's pointing to his own, his own death and his own resurrection. Yes? All right. Explain the difference between Jesus and the first temple. Yes. Now, what's the difference between Jesus and us? Righteous anger. Yeah, he doesn't have sin. So this is a righteous anger. This is a righteous anger that Jesus can have. God can have a righteous, divine anger because he's righteous. He's without sin. I mean, that's, that's the... I know, we always come in, oh, Jesus is showing the, you know... Is it or, being angry is in and of itself is not sin. That what we do with that anger might result in sin, in what we do or say or whatever that might be. Jesus had every right to go into his father's house and say, you, you're, you are totally misusing this. This is my dad's house. You, this should not be going, you should not be cheating, stealing, and all of that. So that's what that's what that is. So this 
you know, I think this, if this happened early, then it followed Jesus for three years. If this happened later in his ministry, it still, it still will come up. It's G- and, and there are only a few times that we hear of Jesus being in the temple in his earthly ministry. One is when he's 12, and this is the other place, in the temple itself. I mean, kind of probably, he was probably in here as that was, you know, he's turning the tables over here and they're going, oh, boo. of course, it's 300,000 people. I mean, it's a huge crowd. And I, and I, and I don't know if this is true or not because I haven't found the answer to that. Would, would this have been the first time that commotion would have been happening out here selling and thing? I, I just, I don't think so. I, I think people might just do things to irritate people. I don't know. I mean, I haven't found any external evidence. I haven't done a lot of research on that. But uh, we do hear how Pontius Pilate slaughtered people, Jews, when they were doing their religious celebrations. So I I don't know. There's no roof over the temple? No. Well, the temple, the temple itself, this is, when we say temple, many times we got to think of like when we say we're going to church, I'm sure you say, I'm going to church today for Bible class. Well, we're not in church, church. You're here, church. Mm-hmm. So the temple would have been the building itself. And then all these different courts. You know, the court of the priests, court of the men, court of the women, court of the Gentiles. But there was no... Now this, in this part, they call this the colonnade of Solomon. This this would have been covered up. And... and they think this was a rather large, like a big porch. They call it porch, so there was an overhang. So if it did rain, or snow, or whatever, that people might go in here to protect themselves from that. But they they said that this, that there was like uh, 10 football fields. I mean, huge, huge. Uh, if you go to Jerusalem, would you would, did you get to go see the temple? Um, and the 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 stones on the bottom are still there. I mean, huge, huge. I mean, 10, 20 tons, huge stones that... Um, we couldn't get very far in. Right. Um, um, I, I was able to sit on those steps on the outside yeah. where Jesus taught, mm-hmm. which was very impressive. Yeah. So, I mean, part of the temple grounds, the temple itself, is not there, but all the supporting structures, stones that are, are there, you can see them, and technically you're supposed to be able to touch them, all things like that. But there's the Wailing Wall, which I'm not, I'm not quite sure where that is in that, but you, you see that. You see that in the news every once in a while. Um, now, today... Oh, I don't have it in here. Today... Where the temple would be is the Dome of the Rock, where Muhammad, Muslims, that's their sacred space. And that's where supposedly the rock that God spoke to Abraham. Well, and things like that. So you that's where in order for the temple to be built, it has to be built in the exact same spot as the Dome of the Rock right now. Which is not going to be built until the Dome of the Rock is not there anymore. So that's I have a poster upstairs with that. I should have brought that down. Oh, well. Well, it's just hard to imagine that many people. So it had to be huge. Huge. It, had to be it was huge. If you, right. When we get to Palm Sunday, Jesus rides triumphant into Jerusalem. It was a huge thing. I mean, at the beginning of the week, Jesus' popularity is huge. And by Friday, he's hanging on the cross. And people are probably going, what happened? I mean... They, they would have, some of them would have surmised, oh, and thought conspiracy, oh, Jesus was set up, oh, and they would have been correct that, that that's what happened. So we do that. All right, I, I have four minutes. Because uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, where Paul talks about um, this the destroy this temple and rebuild, meaning his hanging on the cross. And, and he uses these words. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. It doesn't make sense. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. So, 
as we look at the cross of Jesus, we go, oh, there's our salvation. But there are other people who would look at the cross who are not believers and say, what a tragedy, what a waste. Why is that loser hanging on the cross? So that's what that is. So he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. In other words, I'm going to turn the world upside down. What you think is terrible is really my plan of salvation. What you think is a plan of salvation is really not it's of this world. Uh, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Is not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to those who believe. So Paul says here, yeah, salvation comes through your faith in Jesus. We don't have to do anything? No, you don't have to do anything. Jesus did it all. So that's that foolishness. For Jews demand signs. Huh, yeah, give us a sign, Jesus. Greeks demand wisdom. They seek wisdom. They want to talk through it. But we preach Christ crucified as stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. And that's Paul. We always preach Christ crucified. We always talk about Jesus' death and his resurrection. But to those who are both calm, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So God, he's saying it's, it's upside down. What you think it should be, it's upside down. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were, very, were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. And God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So we have this turning everything upside down. Technically, the Israelites should have never gotten out of Egypt because Egypt was the world power. They were the strength. And yet, what does God do? And he doesn't even use a, an army to make it happen. He does his plagues. We get to Jesus, and he's cleaning out the temple, and they say, give us a sign, and Jesus says, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll rate, bring it back to life. Jesus' death brings us life. Huh. And so that is just, to the world, that is foolishness. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, I was talking about the Dome of the Rock. Muslims believe in order to be saved, you have to do good works. You have to do, your good works have to outweigh your bad. So at the end, you kind of hope at the scale is that your good works are more, but you never know. We come along and we say, oh, Jesus did it all for you. I don't have to do anything in order to be saved. That makes no sense. And it's not supposed to. At least from the world's perspective, from God's perspective, from grace, we say, oh, yeah, that makes total sense. Huge sense. Huge sense. So uh, that's what's going on with that. Let's turn to the colic of the day. And I think this is um, the, the psalm <clears throat> um, talks about what G, you know, the, this, oh, the zeal for my house consumes me. So that, that's from that psalm, but because of time constraints. The colic, oh God, whose glory is always to have mercy. I mean, that's what he does. He wants to show that. Be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. And bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. So you, you, you want to show mercy, God. That's what you, you're gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That's what we want. That's what you do. That you would come to those who have turned them away from you, but that you would call them back and that they would hold fast to your word, the word that you have said, which is the word of grace, the word of the gospel, the good news, God's salvation. So that's what's going on with that. Pretty cool. Next week, Lent 4B. My third most favorite Sunday of the church year. In fact, we had a pastor's meeting yesterday, and we talked about Lent 4B. Awesome. Um, a little note here. Uh, for sure at the 1030 service, I'll talk to you about it, uh, uh, Concordia's 
High School's Chamber Choir is going to be singing with us. Uh, we, don't, we don't know if they're going to be here at 8 o'clock yet. We're, we're negotiating that. But 10.30 for sure. So 10.30 church will have the, it'll be the first time they'll sing in a church in over a year. They finally get to do that. We, we did some negotiating, and we're finally going to make that happen. So we're, we're looking forward to that. I just I got I finalized some things uh, this morning uh, that that's going to happen. So we look forward to that. So, All right, let's close with the Lord's Prayer real quick here. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.